In this lecture, we will begin probing the relationship between environmental stress and civil conflict. Civil conflicts are those conflicts between states and non-state actors within the state's borders. An example would be the ongoing conflict between the now Houthi-controlled government of Yemen and the fighting forces of the deposed Yemeni government. Another type of domestic armed conflict is communal conflict, or conflict between non-state actors that do not directly involve the state. We'll discuss examples of both, as well as the kinds of contextual factors, attributes of states or societies, that make them more likely to experience actual conflict due to environmental stress. Domestic armed conflict, or civil conflict, is by far the most prevalent form of armed conflict today. Since 2015, armed conflict has been more prevalent, there are more active ones simmering, than at any time since the end of the Cold War, or the Second World War. These conflicts have disastrous consequences for the societies in which they occur, destroying lives, physical infrastructure, and degrading public health systems to the point that countries can erase decades of economic development and human development in just a few short months of fighting. They often, as is the case in Syria and Libya, wind up necessitating military intervention and almost always require a humanitarian response. So what do we mean by environmental stress in the context of civil conflict? We mean a combination of population growth, environmental change or degradation, and the maldistribution of resources within society that give rise to strong, competing claims over renewable natural resources like arable land, water, fisheries, or livestock. Because most renewable resources are rival goods, that is, land I use to farm corn is not available for you to graze your cattle on, and water I drink is not available for you to use to irrigate your crops, competing claims over these resources are omnipresent. But actual armed conflict over them is not. Why? Well, for two basic reasons. First, there are, at least most of the time, less costly ways of resolving disputes. Market transactions. You can buy and trade things. Legal decisions. Or decisions that are adjudicated through the courts or addressed by tribal elders. Violence is costly, both for the participants and, as is often the case, for the underlying resource. Violence is by definition risky behavior. It is, for most people, the last resort for resolving a dispute. The risk of personal harm or death is omnipresent. Violence also takes time and resources away from productive activities. If you're a farmer on the edge of subsistence, you'd probably much rather invest your time and money in fertilizer and seed than in an AK-47 rifle, no matter how cheap that rifle might be. And finally, it can be very damaging to the underlying resource. If your goal, for example, is to get back your stolen cattle and bullets start flying, several of those prized animals might be caught and killed in the crossfire. Thus, if there are legitimate institutions and channels for managing and adjudicating these disputes, most parties will, most of the time, avail themselves of them. In many parts of the developing world, those types of institutions are weak. Courts and police officers are neither physically close enough to disputes nor powerful enough to contain them, or viewed with deep skepticism. That is, they lack legitimacy. In these contexts, disputes often involve participants taking matters into their own hands. And perhaps most dangerously, these conflicts are really likely to boil over into armed rebellion when state institutions for resolving disputes are viewed as being partial to, or favoring, one side of the conflict over another. We'll return to this playing favorites issue in just a moment. Other types of structural factors make societies more prone to armed conflict in the presence of environmental scarcity. One of them is whether or not they are characterized by a high degree of social groupness. That's the degree to which ethnic, religious, and or clan identities are vehicles to economic opportunity and political participation. These identities tend to be ascriptive in the sense that they are identities individuals are born into and are relatively hard to change. Now, ethnically homogeneous countries, like the Republic of Korea, and extremely ethnically diverse countries, like Tanzania, are characterized by low groupness. Identities, in terms of ethnic identity or religious identity, are not particularly salient for mobilizing people into the streets or getting what you want economically. In contrast, in countries like Iraq, with Sunni Arabs, Shia Arabs, and Kurds, Burundi and Rwanda, with Tutsis and Hutus in both, and Myanmar with the Bamar, Shan, Kayan, Rakhine, Mon, Kachin, Rohingya, and other ethnic groups, an incredibly multi-ethnic society. Political cleavages and patronage networks break down along identity-based lines, making groupness high. 
Now, groupness is a flexible concept because of the nature of racial, ethnic, and religious identity in a given country is highly context-specific. In the U.S. context, for instance, groupness revolves around racial categories. But it would make little sense for that to be the case in a place like Kenya, where groupness is just as high or even higher than it is in the U.S. context. There, ethnic rather than racial identities matter more. And in Somalia, groupness is based on clan networks and affiliations. Now, the second reason environmental disputes normally do not rise to the level of violent conflict is that environmental resources like arable land and water are only worth fighting over if they are particularly relevant for one's livelihood strategy. That is, when people need to live off the land in a very tangible sense. Singapore is remarkably overcrowded in the sense that it produces little food and has exceptionally high population density. However, vanishingly few Singaporeans are engaged in farming, with the vast majority involved in manufacturing or services. More broadly, direct access to natural resources like land and water is not central to most livelihoods in the developed world. In the countries of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD, like the United States, Germany, France, Korea, others, only 1-3% to of the population works in agriculture. In contrast, agriculture is the primary source of employment in most developing countries. In Ethiopia, Rwanda, and Uganda, agriculture employs roughly three out of every four people in the workforce. In a place like Nepal, the share is closer to two out of three. Less developed countries typically do not have vast systems of water management and irrigation for agriculture, meaning that agricultural productivity is almost entirely determined by weather conditions. In these predominantly rural societies, direct access to land and water is much more tied to the ability to provide for one's family making violent conflict over threats to renewable resource access much more likely. Taken together, environmental stress thus is most likely to result in civil conflict when 1. state institutions are weak or perceived as biased or illegitimate, 2. groupness is high, and 3. when renewable resources are central to livelihoods. These contexts prevail in a large number of developing countries near the equator, which will bear the brunt of climate change impacts in the physical sense. We'll now discuss three common pathways via which environmental stress leads to conflict, distributive conflicts, migration-spurred conflicts, and finally environmental spark-induced conflicts. The most common types of distributive conflict relate to communal conflict over usage rights to renewable resources like land, water, or cattle. For instance, the Pocot-Turkana conflict has been ongoing since 1995 with peaks in violence occurring in 1999, 2008, and 2015. This conflict is located in northwestern Kenya in Turkana district, with some spillover into neighboring Uganda. It is a non-state conflict, by and large. The armed groups are not affiliated with the Kenyan government, but rather with their respective tribes. The climate in this region is quite arid, roughly equivalent to the climate in Barstow, California. Barstow is not known for much, other than for being a good place to gas up on the way to or from Vegas from Southern California. The climate is warm year-round and quite arid. Ground cover is mostly scrub brush, hardier weeds and grasses, and some cactus. That is, it's not exactly ideal for planting. It's not exactly ideal for herding, either, but nevertheless, that's the dominant livelihood in the region. For both the Pocot and Turkana, grazing cattle and other animals are the most important assets that they have, and their primary means of securing livelihoods. The Pocot are an ethnic group composed mostly of pastoralists. Pastoralists are people who keep livestock and graze them across rangelands, living semi-nomadic lifestyles. They speak of one of a dozen or so southern Nilotic, or originating in the southern Nile Basin, languages in Kenya. These women are from the Pocot tribe. The Turkana are an ethnic group also composed again of mostly pastoralists who speak Turkana, an eastern Nilotic language. The distinction between Southern and Eastern Nilotic is important because it helps us to know that these groups diverged, linguistically and culturally, several thousand years ago. This has a variety of implications, but one of the most important is that their common ancestry is effectively ancient history. In pastoralist societies, livestock functions not only as a milk and meat producer, but as a form of currency used for bride price negotiations and dowries. Often, a young man will be given a single goat with which to start a herd, and he will accumulate more via animal husbandry, and potentially, raiding or stealing from other herds. If he wants to get married, he's going to have to do this over and over and over again until he can convince the society that he is a viable adult for marriage. Livestock, especially cattle, are very water-intensive, and in an arid environment, 
This means access to the few seasonal rivers and streams in the region is key, as is access to boreholes and watering stations in the dry season. Raiding between these two communities has occurred for many decades, if not centuries, but has become far more lethal since the 1990s. The reasons are two. First, the end of the Cold War saw the massive weapons caches of Eastern Europe sold off on international arms markets, flooding those markets with Kalashnikov-style automatic rifles and other small arms. The technology of conflict is much more deadly now than it was when these encounters were fought with spears and arrows, and many of them still are, in some instances. Second, Kenyan organized crime has realized the economic value of cattle outside of the region, and begun subsidizing raiding activities and purchasing cattle for sale in more urban markets. So let's think about this conflict in terms of the contextual factors we've discussed earlier. First, is environmental stress high? Yes, the population of the region nearly doubled, from about 500,000 in 1999 to just shy of 1 million a decade later. That's 5.2% average annual population growth almost twice as fast as population growth in Kenya on average. And in terms of dependence on rural livelihoods, well, pastoralism is one of the most land, water, and animal-dependent livelihoods one could imagine. And what about state capacity and legitimacy? For most of Kenya's independence, the Turkana region has been very lightly administered. These maps of road networks and cell coverage in Kenya help tell the story. With very little infrastructure and very little government presence, the Pokot and Turkana are largely left to their own devices and to manage their own conflicts. Finally, groupness is quite high. The two groups view each other with mistrust and do not have common ancestors or recognize common informal authorities, like tribal elders, as mutually legitimate arbiters of disputes. Now, let's turn to discussing migration field conflicts. Migration field conflicts are typically conflicts between ethnic or religious groups that consider themselves indigenous, that is, the original inhabitants, inhabitants of a given territory, and recent migrants from other regions of the country or outside the country. Migrants come in search of land, often at the prompting of the central government. Central governments may believe it's their responsibility to nation-build and integrate marginal ethnic homelands. Or leaders may be responding to demographic pressures in other parts of the country and seek to ease overcrowding there by encouraging the landless to move. Once this begins, competition for resources between, quote, locals and migrants sparks low-level decentralized conflict, often taking the form of ethnic rioting. Seemingly spontaneous outbreaks of violence targeted at either locals by recent migrants or vice versa that can spiral with initial attacks being met with ever larger tit-for-tat responses fueled by a desire for revenge, fear of being attacked and wanting to take the initiative, and even rumor. Eventually, state forces intervene, typically taking the side, or at least appearing to take the side, of their co-ethnic recent migrants. At this point, many of these migrant-fueled conflicts become civil wars, with locals taking up arms to try to secede from the central government or at least gain greater regional autonomy. The Sri Lankan civil war is often considered the paradigmatic migration fuel conflict and was one of the most brutal ethnic civil wars of the past 30 years, characterized by widespread use of suicide bombing, naval battles, and even air battles. The conflict traces its origins back to the 1960s, when the Sinhalese-dominated government began resettling landless peasants from the densely populated southwestern region of the country to the eastern and northeastern regions, which were the homeland of the Tamils, a separate ethnic group. Tensions between the recent arrivals, the Sinhalese, and the recipient Tamil communities ultimately resulted in bouts of ethnic rioting. By the 1970s, this persistent ethnic rioting and perceived bias of state forces had caused large-scale displacement of Tamils to the Jaffna Peninsula, the far north of the country, that would be the epicenter of the eventual rebellion. <clears throat> in 1976, the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam were formed and began a campaign to end Sinhala influence over the Tamil homeland. The Sri Lankan Civil War really began in earnest in 1983 and lasted until the Tamil Tigers were defeated in 2009. The advance needed 10 months, but at the end it took just a few hours for the Sri Lankan army to take control of the town of Milativu, the Tamil Tigers' last major stronghold. The fighting was intense, the army said, but in the end they had too many men and too much firepower for the rebels. It was a hard battle and it was intense fighting. We were expecting a, a bigger fight. Of course, they fought uh, along the bands, but uh, due to our maneuvers, I think uh, they were outflanked and were taken by surprise. 
It was captured on Sunday, the latest in a string of military successes, which has changed the face of this conflict. And these are the first pictures from the town. This was once a lively hub of Tamil Elam, the tiger's self-proclaimed state that at its height stretched from Jaffna in the north to Batakaloa in the east. In Mulativu, there is no longer the Tamil tigers, Tamil civilians or the notion of Tamil Elam. For the tigers and their followers, shattered dreams and shattered lives. The army has paid a price too. Before reaching the town, they suffered high casualties, overcoming a string of defences like these heavily fortified buns that ringed Mulativu. It came down to hand-to-hand -to -hand fighting. We had a fair number of casualties, yes. But uh, the morale was very high. Very high. Troops want to get at the bunt and cross the bunt. That was their intention. So they were highly committed and they put their 100%. The army is pushing the Tigers back metre by metre and a big part of their success has been the complete control in the air, enabling attack and reconnaissance. Fighting in the jungle would hamper that. The battle is now raging about a kilometre and a half away from here where the army says the Tamil Tigers are resisting fiercely. But inch by inch they're pushing them back to the place they will have to make their last stand and that is the thick jungles around here. The Tigers waged a war from the jungles 25 years ago and it is feared they could once again pursue a guerrilla campaign from the dense bush of the north. And the troops are trained, so fighting in jungles would not uh, cause a problem to the Sri Lankan army troops. In the last year, this army division took nearly 700 square kilometres of territory and killed more than 2,000 Tamil Tigers. But in this time, less than 200 Tamil civilians have gone over to the government side. They say it's because the Tigers are forcefully using them as a human shield. But the Tigers say the civilians are fearful of government abuse. No one knows for sure. There is no independent corroboration of any of the claims. But in Mulativu, the army is digging in, perhaps as a precaution against a massive Tamil Tiger counteroffensive that many feared but hasn't happened. It shows that this war may still have some way to go. Tony Bertley, Al Jazeera, Mulativu. Now, it's important to note that most of the time, migration is a beneficial, adaptive strategy for dealing with environmental change and livelihood change more generally. It's only in certain circumstances and contexts that this adaptive strategy leads to outright conflict. Those conflicts are the exceptions, not the rule. Finally, a third category of environmental stress-induced conflict are environmentally sparked conflicts. In these conflicts, the central issues of the conflict typically are not about access to natural resources. Rather, the conflict is sparked by a shock to the system, like a drought or a food price spike, that highlights the frailties and tensions of the political system. Consider one of the dominant narratives around the ongoing Syrian civil war. From 2006 to 2011, Syria experienced one of the worst long-term droughts in the history of the Fertile Crescent, with climate scientists calling it the worst in the instrumental record. Fleeing the drought imposed significant hardship on more than 1.5 million people, mostly agricultural workers and family farmers, who moved from rural areas to cities, slums, and camps in and around Syria's major cities. This mass rapid migration placed significant strain on these urban centers, especially as food prices skyrocketed across the Middle East and North Africa. Taking cues from protests in neighboring countries and angered by spiraling food prices, some of these displaced young men began protesting the al-Assad regime, demanding the release of political prisoners in March of 2011. Now, these demonstrations began peacefully, but escalated to violent clashes as the security forces responded in a very heavy-handed manner. By July of 2011, these clashes had erupted into a full-blown insurgency. Now, in this narrative, a historic drought led to crop and livestock failure, which led to rural hardship and migration to urban centers, which led to dissatisfaction with the government and employment prospects, which led to protest and violent repression, which led to dissidents taking up arms. Now, the Syrian rebels are not fighting over access to natural resources, per se. They are now fighting to take down a brutally repressive, exclusionary government. But an environmental shock may nevertheless have been the straw that broke the proverbial camel's back. This lecture has discussed the role of environmental stress in civil conflicts and elaborated both a typology of conflicts, distributive conflicts, migration sparked conflicts, and environmentally sparked conflicts, and the contextual factors like low state capacity and legitimacy, high groupness, and high dependence on agricultural livelihoods that make these conflicts more likely to occur.
In doing so, we focus largely on how, on how environmental stress in a particular country affects conflict in that particular country. In the next lecture, we'll turn to how, via global markets, environmental shocks can propagate through the international system, or how wildfires in Russia led to protests and regime change in Egypt.